Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you who are new to the channel, if you begin to like what you are hearing, please join the family by clicking on the subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time a video is uploaded. Today's video will be a different one as I posted a poll three days ago asking which genre everyone would like to hear today. What got tied was true unsolved mysteries and true paranormal stories. So, today will be that hybrid video. The way I will be reading the stories and cases will be a story and a case, a story and a case, so on and so forth. And now, without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Haunted and Unsolved Mysteries. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for education and entertainment purposes. Warning, some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Western discretion is highly advised. I'm a psychiatric nurse, and early in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. One of our residents was an elective mute, which means that he didn't or wouldn't or couldn't talk, but there was no medical reasons as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life, and in fact, seemed quite normal back then, with the exception of being close to seven feet tall. He'd been raised in the Deep South and joined the military when he was 19. But one night, he vanished. He was declared AWOL, and eventually, he was declared missing and dead. Ten years later, a seven-foot-tall man walked into a VA hospital emergency room in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Dushin. That's not his real name, by the way and I've been dead for ten years. Those were the last words he ever spoke. He was covered with dust, and he was wearing the same clothes he'd been reported to be wearing the night he vanished. His social security number had not been used, and he had no identification on his person. However, they were able to identify him, I guess via fingerprints. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man and that whomever was claiming to be him simply could not be. They demanded not to be contacted again. Marion paced all day, every day, moving his mouth that looked like talking or muttering, but no sound came out. He had an unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open, as if he were laughing heartily but not even a breath could be heard. If I talked to him, he appeared to listen, periodically throwing his head back in that laughter-mimicking way of his. Various medications were tried, but they did not affect him either positively or negatively. Occupational therapy did nothing because Marion would just grin, and unless told to stay put, he'd get up and start pacing again. On my last day at that job, the last thing I saw was Marion, pacing in the parking lot, throwing his head back to laugh. Later, I wondered if all along I'd been dealing with a ghost. All these years later, I still don't know. The Disappearance of Shirley Lone Thunder Early Life Shirley Joanne Lone Thunder was born on January 3, 1966, as the oldest of five children. From the White Bear First Nations near Carlisle, Saskatchewan, she grew up in Saskatoon, making trips back and forth between the city and the reserve. Known for being stubborn and strong-willed, Shirley struggled with substance abuse and was said to be working in the sex trade. She was a mother of two children and worked on the streets to help make ends meet. In 1991, Shirley and her children were staying with her mother. 
she was reportedly looking for her own place and, according to her mother, was starting university the following year. However, her brother, Stacy Longfender, says this isn't true that his sister was looking to get out of Saskatoon to avoid the police. Disappearance Shirley went missing on December 24, 1991, four days after she was last seen by her family. She said she was going out to buy presents that afternoon in downtown Saskatoon, but didn't come home. Unfortunately, Shirley's family didn't realize she was missing until March of 1992, when they were contacted by her lawyer after she missed a court date. Upon receiving the news, she was reported missing to the Saskatoon Police Service. The Search Some believe Shirley's disappearance may be related to serial killer John Martin Crawford, who was active in the Saskatoon area around the time she went missing. He killed his first victim, Mary Jane Sirloin, in the early 1980s and was sentenced to 10 years in prison on a charge of manslaughter. He was released in 1989, during which time he sexually assaulted a woman named Teresa Kamach, but wasn't arrested. Instead, she was. In 1995, Crawford was arrested and charged with the murders of Eva Tasep, Shelley Napop, and Kalinda Waterhen. He was convicted in June of 1996 and sentenced to three life stints with no chance for parole for 25 years to be served concurrently. He passed away on December 16th of 2020 at the Regional Psychiatric Center in Saskatoon. No cause of death was revealed. Shirley's disappearance is listed as a historical missing persons case by the Saskatoon Police Service with it still considered active. For years, her mother was the point of contact with investigators, but she has since passed on. According to Stacy, those responsible for the investigation haven't contacted him since around 1997 or 1998. The Details Shirley Joanne Lone Thunder was 25 years old when she went missing from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada on December 24th of 1991. She had a slender build, standing between 5'3 and 5'5, and weighing between 128 to 130 pounds. She had long black hair and brown eyes, and was last seen wearing a black jacket, blue denim jeans, and white running shoes. Shirley has two tattoos, a heart on her left ankle, and a bird and heart on her right calf. She also has a four-centimeter scar on her left cheek. Case Contact Information Shirley's case is classified as endangered missing. Anyone with information regarding her disappearance is asked to contact the Saskatoon Police Department at 306-975-8300. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at either 306-931-8477 or 1-800-222-8477. A bit of a background about me. I'm a Hindu 20-year-old Indian studying business laws at an institute of national importance. I'll be graduating in 2027. My background will better help you understand later why I have claimed what I claim in the title. The incident goes back to my 10th grade, or what you commonly refer to as sophomore year, in the U.S. I was 15 when it happened, so essentially our Indian high schools follow this grade-based STEAM selection process, which is how you end up pursuing either science commerce, or humanities in your plus two. So my school is kind of one of the best schools in India. Not a very fancy private school, though. It is a co-ed institution, which produces apparently a fairly decent alma mater. However, our school is infamous for toxicity. The kids engage in all sorts of ruckus, and it'd be pretty well established in my scenario to say that they made my life a living hell. 
especially given how our culture is here in the northeastern plains of India. The most toxic bit about our schooling ecosystem is the after-school coaching institutes and the crowds of mothers that mingle outside while their kids further wreck their brains after five hours of grueling school lessons. Now, I was a very, very dumb kid. I never was ranked in class. I never even won any medals. That was throughout my schooling years. So, the time for our selection test at school comes. Of course, I flunked. So, I did even for my pre-boards. I remember the day when our selection tests arrived, as if it were like yesterday. I get the rank lists forwarded on my phone. My name is nowhere on the science list. My mother starts crying. My grandfather had tears in his eyes. My father calls me up to tell me he didn't expect any return on his investment. That I was what I was because that's how God intended me to be. Those were his words before he hung up the call. I was a failure. An official one. I knew word had spread through the network of the mothers that my mother's son wasn't smart enough to get a rank in the list of 376 science students. This was happening from 3 to 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., I can't handle the atmosphere at home anymore. I closed the doors and windows of my room, writing myself with a towel, shower cap, and a paper cutter. First, I tried choking myself with a shower cap, but I experienced nothing more than a short span blackout. I don't know what were the thoughts going on through my head, but I threw away the shower cap in a fit of rage and annoyance. Next, all the while crying and feeling my heart bleed, I sit on my bed with my head in my hands. My thoughts were cloudy. I pulled out a pen and notebook from my cupboard and started scribbling. I wrote a letter to any vile entity, living or otherwise, containing something along the following phrases. With the willingness to devour a soul, to end my suffering, to give me eternal torment in exchange for momentary solace, that I deserve to rot in hell because of the worthless and sinful kid I have been. In essence, I wrote what I think of now, an open-ended contract to some entity, and I proceeded to sign it with blood oozing out of my paper cut, wounds on my left hand. I did all this in a disturbed state of mind, and deep down, what I could honestly tell is that I was praying that somebody, there be somebody to listen to me to love me for the good person I knew I had tried my best to be. But there was also a lot of pain and disturbance going on in my head. I don't know what struck me, but then I remember very vividly getting up from my bed after having prepared the contract and taking the piece of paper with some matchsticks near my window sill. I opened the windows and burnt the letter, and then closed them, immediately to go on and hang myself from the ceiling fan with the towel. As I made the noose, my grandfather started shouting my name, and my mother, still distraught and crying, banged hard on my door. I told them multiple times to go away, but they said they'd break in if I didn't open the door, and that they didn't want me to harm myself. As soon as my mother comes in, she is holding her phone in my hands, telling me that she got news I was sixth in the wait list for science students. Fast forward, I started getting good grades without studying, and I have believed it to have been my luck. And one way or another, getting pushed towards a specific purpose. I don't know what that purpose is yet, but I get some sort of premonition. I can't really tell if that purpose is good or bad. But so far, I have managed to get into a top management law school, like a premium Indian institute, and been scoring fairly well, having worked a couple of internships at reputed tier one law firms as well. I don't know if it's some sort of psychological deception or my mind on play pretend. But now when I think of it, that day 
I did what every thing happens in a legal contract. Everything that has been the norm in common law contracts. Looking at that incident from a common law perspective and applying the laws of contracts from the jurist Anthons. Number one, I had no intention to contract. Number two, I had offered a fair consideration in exchange for a promise that is fulfillment of my ask of redeeming me from the pain of being a failure. Number three, I acted in free will, not in a state of undue influence or coercion. Note, I was in distress, but that was not caused or influenced by the other party, i.e. the speculated entity. And number four, I made the contract binding upon myself by entering my blood as signature besides it, also identifying me as a person. The reason why I wrote it addressed to any vile entity is because during my depression days and my search for an answer to my pains, I looked up King Solomon and his lesser key and the legends of how the jinns and demons would help him be the ruler of such a large kingdom and was hooked upon the remote abstract idea that they might just be true. But being a Hindu, I did and still do have a skepticism that even if they exist, why would they deal with a different faith? And if it is indeed a possibility, it poses so many questions about how I look upon the idea of God. Matthew Margolez, Savage Murder of a Young Boy Unsolved for Decades when 13-year-old Matthew Margolez failed to show up for dinner on the night of August 31, 1984, authorities in Greenwich, Connecticut began a massive search in the Pemberwick Woods and the Byram River for the young boy. Despite having numerous suspects and ample evidence over the decades, police have not been able to make an arrest for a crime that turned a picturesque New England town into an utter turmoil. Matthew was found dead five days after he went missing on a hillside near his home. It's a murder case that has haunted his community and baffled investigators. Who was Matthew Margolez? If you were ever out in the Pemberwick neighborhood of Greenwich, Connecticut, on a warm summer day break in the 1980s, you were bound to see Matthew Margolez. He was a regular at the Byram River with a fishing pole in hand. He could also be seen riding his bike to his grandparents' home or standing outside the local deli. Matthew was in the eighth grade at Western Junior High School. Matthew was very close with his grandfather, George Miasga, who taught his grandson all about the outdoors while they spent time fishing along the Byram River. Matthew's mother, Mary Ann Margolez, described his grandfather as being her son's very best friend in the world. According to Dark Dunn East, Matthew's parents divorced in 1983 and his father left the home. The separation from his father drew Matthew and his grandparents closer. He lived with his mother and sister just a few blocks from his grandparents. Matthew always preferred being in his grandparents' home and often spent the night there. Matthew loved his time with his grandfather, and George adored his grandson. They would adventure together, locating the best trout fish spots and finding edible berries. George would teach him outdoor survival skills, like walking on leaves and sticks without making noise. George and Matthew spent nearly every day together until the summer of 1984 when George was told he had an aggressive form of cancer and he was unable to do the things he'd love doing with Matthew. Eventually, George became homebound and their days of fishing were over. Still, Matthew stayed by his grandfather's side, ensuring he took his medications and that George was okay when his grandmother Stella was at work a happy place in the face of tragedy. In August 1984, George succumbed to cancer, and his death shattered Matthew's world. However, 
Matthew could still be found at the Bayram River waiting for a fish. Fishing was Matthew's happy place amidst the chaos in his personal life. It was Labor Day weekend that year, and while most children left town with their families, Matthew planned to spend the weekend along the river fishing, as he always did with George. He slept at his grandmother's home on Thursday, August 30th, and the following day, at sunrise, he was out the door to go fishing, just like he used to do with his grandfather. What Happened to Matthew On August 31st, 1984, Matthew dropped by the Spartan Deli to prepare for his fishing day. He bought a carton of milk and a pastry, then headed to a nearby bridge. About 30 minutes later, a woman asked Matthew how the fish were biting, and he responded by showing his string of fish and saying he was catching a lot. According to the Greenwich Times newspaper, Matthew then changed locations on the river and went along the east side of the river to Pemberwick Road. At approximately 11.30 a.m., Matthew headed back to his grandmother Stella's house. Stella arrived home around noon. Matthew was not there, but his wet corduroy pants were hanging on a chair, and his trout were in the sink. She left a note for him, where she left to run errands that read, Get rid of the fish in the sink. Greenwick Times reports that Matthew was spotted all around Pemberwick. He had been seen walking down Morgan Avenue and later at Sparta Deli, a hangout for neighborhood teenagers. There was a group of older teens called the Valley Boys who had a reputation for malicious crimes and drugs. According to friends, Matthew began hanging around the group after his grandfather died. At 5 p.m., Matthew's mother, Mary Ann, pulled into the driveway of her mother Stella's house. The house was empty. Stella had taken Matthew's sister Stacy to an appointment so she waited there, thinking Matthew may have gone along. Still not home. When Stella returned home, Matthew was not with her. They waited for Matthew to come home for the next couple of hours. Matthew was a good kid, and normally his mother didn't worry about him being a little late. However, as the hours passed, Marianne couldn't help but feel like something was terribly wrong. Marianne called the police to make a missing persons report. It didn't take long, and the police were soon scouring the banks of the Byram River for a little boy that had been seen fishing so many times before. Police searched the area. Police brought in search dogs at approximately 11 a.m. the next day. Using the pair of pants Matthew had left at his grandmother's house, the canines tracked Matthew's scent to a waterfall that was located below a dam on the river. Divers were deployed to that area of the river to ensure Matthew had not fallen in and drowned. Authorities also searched his grandfather's gravesite at St. Mary's Cemetery, along with an abandoned house on a farm. In addition to the extensive ground and water search with canines and divers, authorities also conducted an aerial search. Volunteers and officers from the Greenwick Police Department, firefighters in Westport Police Barracks, dedicated days searching for Matthew. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, also joined the efforts, but their involvement was short-lived because foul play had not been suspected. However, four days into the search, police cut back, citing that they would have to scale the search unless there was reliable sightings, a good lead, clothing, or signs that Matthew was in the area. Finding Matthew Police ended the six-day search on September 5th of 1984, saying they were certain they had located Matthew's body on a wooded hill near a wooded ravine. A neighbor who had been helping track Matthew found a pair of black and white checkered sneakers at around 4 p.m. on that Wednesday and called the police. Chief Thomas Keegan stated officers located the body soon after the shoes were found and were treating the death as a homicide due to the location. According to Keegan, Matthew's mutilated body was found in a makeshift shallow grave and had been partially covered with leaves. According to autopsy records, 
Matthew fought off his attacker before being strangled and stabbed repeatedly. A spokesperson for the medical examiner's office said the boy died of traumatic asphyxiation and multiple stab wounds. He was stabbed a total of 13 times, and his clothing used as gags and ligatures to suffocate him. Keegan stated, there were numerous cuts on his arms, leading investigators to surmise that he had tried hard to fight back. Matula Velasquez ran the Spartan Deli. He was such a quiet kid to be stabbed, Velasquez told the Hartford Current newspaper. I can see some of the other troublemakers around here getting into more trouble, but not him. When Matthew was found, he wore a t-shirt and undershorts with his athletic shorts nearby. There was no evidence of sexual assault, but authorities said they weren't ruling it out. This is Greenwick, man, said Jeff Tipp, an attendant who worked at a Glenville local gas station when interviewed by the Hartford Current. This stuff doesn't happen around here. I turned the lights on and locked the doors at 7 last night. Lots of people are keeping their kids real close to them today, what with school just opening and all. Investigation Authorities found a ten-and-a-half-inch knife underneath Matthew's body and believed it was the murder weapon. However, the fishing pole Matthew had with him has never been located. Two weeks after Matthew went missing, a woman in a nearby apartment building told investigators that she had heard a young person screaming at around 6 p.m. on the day Matthew disappeared. In October of 1984, the FBI conducted a psychological profile of the potential suspect. They said the killer may have been a local white male acquaintance who was knowledgeable of Matthew's love for fishing and the outdoors. Authorities do not believe it was a person from outside Greenwick or anybody who did not know the child. In October 2000, the New London newspaper reported on information that the suspect in the killing of Matthew may have been under the influence of drugs and taken multiple doses of mescaline that day. There were several teen suspects that displayed suspicious behavior around the time of the killing. Despite hundreds of leads over the years, investigators are no closer to solving this case. In fact, police have been accused of botching the investigation. Matthew's mother remains concerned that a killer walked free. My feeling is still that the perpetrator of the crime is from around that area. I would say under 20. Peter Robbins, detective who investigated Matthew's case. Two suspects. According to a write-up by local Greenwick residents Tom Alessi on his Matthew Margolez website, the police investigation over the years focused on between three and five suspects, with other reports stating that the number could have been as high as eight. Of those suspects, two young people would be the most scrutinized. The first was a local bully who had been known to cause trouble in the neighborhood. A former neighbor stated that the bully had threatened his own son with a knife similar to the one used in Matthew's death. He also had a history of brutal and sexualized attacks on other teens. It was learned that Matthew's body was found behind the bully's house, quite close to his property. It's theorized that Matthew could have been a victim of the bullying by the suspect and his gang of friends. The second suspect was a teenager with a criminal record who lived in nearby Port Chester. He had been seen covered in dirt the evening Matthew disappeared, and he also had dirt under his fingernails. He also had Matthew's fishing pole and knife. The suspect stated to a police officer that he knew Matthew and had fished with him. Investigators tried several times to question the teen and administer a polygraph with his father present, but he kept evading the meetings. Eventually, his father said his son would no longer cooperate, and the suspect joined the military, where he was dismissed for criminal behavior and ended up in a state penitentiary. A Mother's Nightmare Marianne talked to the press soon after her son's body was found and showed concern for other children in her community. She also asked for help to solve her son's murder case. I'm asking the children in particular. Kids, you tried hard to find Matthew. 
If one of you saw something, don't be afraid to come forward, Marianne told the AP. Think of the other kids that you can help. Despite the horrific nature of the crime, Marianne has told others that she refuses to become consumed by bitterness and rage. She would instead focus on the good that came from her precious son's life. Over 500 people attended Matthew's St. Paul's Roman Catholic Church funeral. Marianne recalled her son's love for the outdoors and thanked the police, firefighters, and volunteers who spent five days looking for her son. A children's choir of Matthew's classmates sang during the funeral mass, sounding to some in attendance like angels singing in heaven. Matthew was buried in a family plot at St. Mary's Cemetery in Greenwick. The little boy whom the townspeople love seeing with his fishing pole may be gone, but the community has not forgotten him. Case files have yellowed in the decades after the senseless murder of Matthew. Police say they have resurrected the case numerous times and are still actively investigating. As of 2001, the reward for information has doubled to $60,000. Marianne says the investigation may bring some peace to her family if it is solved. For Stella and Marianne, it seems like yesterday that Matthew, with a smile on his face, was heading out the door to go fishing. His death has left an empty place in their hearts. The pain peaks annually at birthdays and holidays, Marianne told the New York Post. We will never know what he would have chosen to do with his life. This is my ghost story. This happened to me in 2001. I was an intern for a theater in Glensdale that used to be a mansion temple. I was an intern for a theater in Glensdale that used to be a mason temple. It was seven stories with a lower level that used to be a restaurant nightclub in the 1930s. It had gutted restaurant seats. The second floor used to be an old movie room. On the bottom level was a prop cage that had theater built into it that contained thousands of props like tea seats, spoons and stuff since a classical theater company ran the theater and they performed Shakespeare and Dickens, etc. One night I was working late with the tech director in a room adjacent to the prop cage right by the staircase that led up to the main room of the theater. I heard props moving. It sounded like cups were knocking against each other or clinking, like they were rolling on the floor. The tech director went to investigate and saw nothing. When he left the room, I heard footsteps coming down the stairs, although the theater was empty. The tech director returned and we checked the stairs, but nobody was there. I told him I thought it was a ghost and he laughed and said, there was no such thing as ghosts. When suddenly we both heard loud footsteps stomping down the stairs, crazy loud and very threatening. We looked at each other in the eyes, and then something truly weird happened that I will never forget. Someone stomped on the floor right above us and scratched the side of the walls, but instead of the walls, as if they were scratching the pipes, and then we heard a loud bong noise, as if someone had flicked a door stopper, almost cartoon-like, bong, all at the same time. The tech director and I stared at each other in shock, and then we got the fuck out. We couldn't believe what happened. We'd heard stories about footsteps and other actors seeing ghosts, but this was truly bizarre. What kind of ghost stomps on the ceiling, scratches the pipe in the walls, and makes loud bong noises? The bong noise sounded like a rubber stopper being flicked, like a sound effect you might hear in a cartoon. We had to return in a few days to finish working, and the moment we were alone in there, it started stomping in the room above, but more like someone was walking around, although the theater was empty again. Since it was Christmas break and no one was in the theater, we used keys to let ourselves inside, and then the tech director called to it again, making fun of it, like it had done that before, when suddenly... I felt fear. 
from the ghost, or whatever that thing was, in the room with us. It was afraid. I don't know why I felt that it was afraid, but somehow I know that it was. I smelled fear coming from it, as if it was scared of us. It scratched the walls again, but I know that it was that one. It was scared. We left again because, even though I knew it was scared, I was terrified and didn't want to hang around in a haunted old mason church. Months later, a group of us closed the theater after a show on the third floor. We turned off all the lights and locked the doors. We stood outside talking about our show when we heard books dropping on the second floor. We were standing under the window of the second floor, and we all heard large books being dropped. An entire group of people had heard it all at the same time. This was my last encounter with the ghosts in that building, although I heard other stories from the actors there. One actress told me that she locked up one night and heard a bell ringing in another room, and she quietly walked down the stairs from the third floor to the main floor, with the bell noise getting louder and louder, until it was ringing right behind her ear. But no one was there. She turned around and yelled at the ghost to stop scaring her on the main floor and ran out. She won't be alone in the building ever and told us that she had seen hangers fly across the room in the middle of stage performances and the two other actors were standing with her and the wings waiting to go on when all they saw were hangers from the costume rack fly across the room. She and another actor claimed to have seen an old man ghost during stage performances suddenly materialize on stage or in the wings, but no one in the audience could see him. An actor said he exited a scene and had to walk through this ghost, and when he returned to the stage, he was white because he was terrified. Well, I never saw a ghost, but I had heard one. When my internship was over, I never returned to that theater, but I saw the technical director many years later, who eventually quit. He said that when he had worked late building sets, he would hear his tools moving, or if he was sawing wood, he would hear something moving in another room, and when he would inspect it, nothing would be there. He quit eventually, and honestly, I don't blame him. I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts, but I still can't explain what happened to the technical director and me that night. No one was in that building, and if there was, how could one person stomp down the stairs, then stomp on the ceiling, scratch the pipes alongside the walls, the side walls, mind you, and make a large spring go bong? Super weird stuff. I don't know. What are your thoughts? The Disappearance of Lena Derrick Early Life Lena Derrick was born in 1976 to Marge and Darwin Haugen. From Gittenau, First Nation in British Columbia, she was known for being a prankster who easily made friends with those around her. At the time of her disappearance, Lena was a 19-year-old forestry student in Northwest Community College in Houston, British Columbia. The program was the perfect fit for the nature-loving outdoors woman, who had an interest in logging. Disappearance Lena was visiting her parents in Terrace, British Columbia, when she went missing. It was common for her to return home whenever she had a break from school, and this time around she'd gotten a ride to Terrace with a classmate. Aware her parents were working all weekend, Lena had dropped her stuff off at their house and decided to go into town. Her stepsister, Clarice Dessert, was driving around at the time and spotted Lena walking down the street. As Lena's father had given Clarice money for her, she pulled over and asked her cousin when she wanted to pick it up. Lena told her she'd stop by her apartment later, at which point the pair parted ways. 
Lena was last seen in the early hours of either October 6th or 7th of 1995, with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police reporting that she'd visited a Petro-Canada gas station along Highway 16, better known as the Highway of Tears, where several women, mainly indigenous, had gone missing. Prior to this, she had been to a local Tim Hortons, Gigi's Pub, and Clarice's apartment on 4456 Lake Else Avenue. Lena had gone to the latter at around 3 a.m. to pick up the money her father had given Clarice. She'd also asked her cousin if she wanted to hang out, but the half-asleep Clarice had said no. When spoken to by investigators, she didn't recall seeing another person or a car with Lena. She did note that her cousin seemed a bit intoxicated, but didn't appear upset or anxious. On October 7th, Darwin and Marge returned home. While Lena wasn't there, they noticed her bag and assumed she'd spent the previous night at a friend's house. Two days later, they still hadn't seen their daughter, nor had she touched her stuff. When she hadn't returned home on October 10th, they became worried, as classes restarted that day and it wasn't like her to miss school. Lena's parents called her friends, but no one had seen her in three days. The same went for family members. This prompted them to contact the local authorities who brushed them off and said she was likely out partying. While Marge and Darwin said otherwise, no police search occurred until a week later. Investigation a month after the missing persons report was filed, a witness, possibly the gas station clerk, came forward to say they'd seen Lena at the aforementioned Petro-Canadian gas station in Thornhill at around 3.30 a.m. on the morning she was last seen. She'd allegedly purchased cigarettes, after which she got into a blue car that drove north to the Northern Motor Inn. Two men were also seen in the vehicle. Following her disappearance, Lena's supposed boyfriend became a suspect in the case. He was a former partner of Clarice's with a history of violence. On the morning after her cousin's disappearance, Clarice received a phone call informing her that he's died by suicide the previous night. While investigators looked into him, they couldn't find any connection between his death and Lena's case. At present, Lena's disappearance is being investigated by E. Panna, an RCMP task force that investigates cases with ties to the Highway of Tears. While the investigation is still open, her family has spoken out about how poorly the authorities have handled it. Details Lena Patricia Derrick was 19 years old when she went missing from Terrace, British Columbia in October of 1995. She had a medium build standing at 5'7 and weighing 154 pounds with shoulder-length black hair and brown eyes. At the time of her disappearance, Lena was wearing a green cotton sweatshirt, black denim pants, running shoes, and black-rimmed plastic glasses. Case Contact Information Lena's case is currently classified as endangered missing with foul play suspected. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact E-Division at Project E-PANA at 778-290-5291 or Terrace RCMP at 250-638-7400. Tips can also be called in anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. This is something that happened to me when I was a kid, and I just wanted to share the story since it stuck with me for so long. I was about seven to eight years old. I can't recall exactly, but it was around that age. One weekend, I was visiting my grandparents, who at the time lived on the countryside. I'm from Bosnia, Europe. They were only about an hour's drive away, and we went there early in the morning. Their house is in a wooded area with a long winding road leading up to each individual house, of which there weren't many, perhaps maybe three or four, maybe more. 
I knew the area well since I went to visit almost every weekend. Besides, going up to the houses, there is one section of the road that leads directly into the woods. Sort of a natural trail. Our car broke down exactly around that spot. Flat tire. Since we were very close to where my grandparents live, and my folks knew I was familiar with the area, they let me go for a walk while my dad fixed the tire. This was at about 9 to 10 a.m. in the morning, so they weren't really afraid to let me run around a bit. Being the curious kid that I was, and yes, I still am, I went for the forest trail since the main dirt road wasn't very exciting. The trees were very tall and dense, so even during the daytime, it was kind of dark. I went up the forest trail for a few hundred meters in until I came to a crossroads. Now, this was more than 20 years ago, but it left a lasting impression on me. So, here is what I recall. In the middle of the crossroads, at the very point that the roads fork, there was a small cave or opening of some sort. I went a bit closer and I noticed what seemed like fireflies sparkling in the pitch black hole. I'm not sure if fireflies even light up during the day, but that's how I remember it. Besides that, I just felt this presence there. As if I wasn't alone there, as if the cavern was beckoning me to enter it. And then I noticed what seemed like several pairs of small red eyes peering from the darkness. At this point, I was quite spooked, thinking it was an animal of some kind, and I decided not to go any further and just slowly back away. This is in Southeast Europe, so there aren't many dangerous animals around. Very rarely a wolf or a bear would be sighted, but usually not near human settlement. Nothing followed me, and I had no trouble getting back. I decided not to tell my parents about this, since I figured they would be mad and wouldn't let me play unsupervised for the remainder of our visit. They decided to leave me with my grandparents and pick me up on Monday, while they went back during the afternoon. I'm very close with my grandmother. She and I are very much alike, especially now as I'm a grown-up. So I told her about the encounter I had. She kind of laughed it off, saying, <laughs> Honey, there's nothing there. I walk there every day. But I was adamant about what I saw, and she agreed we'd go for a walk together and visit that spot. It wasn't far from her house, and we arrived there that same afternoon. We got to the crossroads, and, like she said, there was nothing there. No burrow, no cave. Just a flat spot where the crossroads meet. No traces of it being dug up or buried. Grandma even asked me, Are you sure it was here? And I said yes. She didn't think much of it, chalking it off to childish imagination. But she told me not to venture out here on my own again. We continued our walk, and I just stopped mentioning the event from then on. But to this day, even after all these years... I still remember this quite vividly. I even find it strange I'm able to recall the details. And of course, I know memories can become distorted over time and that what we think we remember may not always be the full picture. Our minds love to fill in the blanks, but I just still feel as if it was the case. I often contemplate what would have happened had I stepped closer or worse tried to enter the dark cave. I've read about evil places in forests around the world or places where time and space can become warped. People walking into what they described as different timelines or alternate dimensions. Perhaps this was one of those places. My grandparents don't live there anymore. Grandpa had passed away when I was 16 years old and my grandma moved to the city in the same building as me and my folks. We still own the house and land there, but I hadn't been there since. My dad goes out there a few times a year just to check up on things and clean up a bit. According to him, the house and land have almost been consumed by vegetation. 
They cut the electricity and water so they wouldn't have to pay the bills, so it's not very convenient staying over. But I do plan on going there sometime, perhaps during my next time off or vacation from work. I really want to go back to that road, assuming it still exists, and just see if I feel anything. Now that I'm an adult with an interest in the paranormal, I'm just so drawn to this memory. Has anyone else experienced something similar? I would love to hear your thoughts. The Abduction of Heather Teague Early Life Heather Teague was born on April 25, 1972, as the first of four children. Growing up in Kentucky, she was known for being a good student and actively involved in her school community. Along with being on the honor roll and cheerleading squad, she was homecoming queen named Junior Miss and active in track and basketball. In her spare time, she enjoyed writing poetry. Following her graduation from Webster County High School, Heather took some time out from education with her and her mother making plans after a few years for her to attend Western Kentucky University. The then 23-year-old hoped to study psychology. At the time of her abduction, Heather was living in Clay, Webster County, Kentucky. She was dating a man 20 years her senior and had gotten involved in drugs. She was known to act erratically as a result of her substance abuse, and she had even been reported missing two weeks prior. When located, she'd said she was just running around. Abduction On August 26, 1995, Heather was sunbathing at Newboro Beach in Spotsville, Henderson County, Kentucky. Around 12.45 p.m. that afternoon, Tim Walthall was looking through his telescope from his Indiana home on the other side of the Ohio River when he saw a man approach the 23-year-old, grabbed her by her hair, and drag her off her lawn chair into a wooded area by the beach. According to Walthall, the abduction had occurred at gunpoint when asked by the authorities to describe the suspect. He reported that the man was white, six foot tall, and weighed between 210 to 230 pounds. He had brown hair that appeared to be a wig, a bushy beard, and was only wearing a pair of jeans and a mosquito net. The Search Upon learning about the abduction, police officers with canines, divers, and helicopter equipped with infrared technology searched Newborough Beach, finding part of Heather's bathing suit and a towel in the woods near the abduction site. Other bits of evidence was located, but investigators said it didn't provide any insight into Heather's whereabouts. During the early stages of the investigation, Heather's current and past boyfriends were interviewed by the authorities, but little was gleaned from these conversations. The first suspect to emerge in the case was Marvin Ray Marty Dill, a Henderson County resident. Dill's red and white Ford Bronco was pulled over during a routine traffic stop shortly after Heather's abduction and found within it were two guns, duct tape, rope, rubber gloves, and strands of hair that looked similar to the missing woman's. Along with the items found in his vehicle, Dill was said to resemble the composite sketch provided by Walthall, and his Bronco had been captured on video in the area on Newborough Beach as farmers had been monitoring the area following incidents of vandalism against their crops. On top of this, Dill's vehicle was seen parked near Heather's 1990 Nissan hatchback. Throughout the end of August 1995 and into that September, investigators received tips connecting Dill to Heather's abduction, prompting them to visit his home. He reportedly told his wife to leave the residence after learning of the officer's presence, at which point he took his own life. When investigators made their way into the home, they found Dill's body, but no evidence Heather had been there. A grand jury had brought forth to hear evidence of Dill's involvement in the case following his death. While attempts were made to have his wife testify as a witness, she evoked her Fifth Amendment rights and refused to answer any questions. 
A second suspect came to investigators' attention in 2004. Christopher J. Bellow, another resident of Henderson County. Bellow had pleaded guilty to attempted involuntary manslaughter in relation to the 1991 death of Catherine Fretzer, a woman with whom he had been having an affair. For the crime, he was sentenced to between 11 and 18 years in prison. Outside of Fetzer's death, Bellow was suspected in the disappearances of Mary Kushtu, Christina Porco, and Shailene Farrell. While he hasn't been charged or convicted in relationship to their cases, the details are as follows. Kushtu was missing from St. Cloud, Florida on May 5, 1995. Bello was in the city at the time of her disappearance. Porco went missing from Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, on November 29, 1986, having left her family's apartment unit after an argument with her mother. She'd reportedly planned to sleep by the complex's pool, but when a friend went to see her, all that was found was her red sweater. While Bello had lived in the state between the late 1980s and early 90s, authorities are still trying to determine his exact whereabouts in 86. Farrell went missing from Pequay, Ohio on August 8, 1994. She was reported missing after missing a work shift. Investigators believe Bello targeted women who resembled Fetzer. Heather, in particular, was around the same height and weight as the deceased woman. As well, he was known to be in the general area at the time of the 23-year-old's abduction, and he left on the same day Dill took his own life. Bello has refused to answer any questions regarding Heather's case. It's believed he and Dill may have abducted her together, with one grabbing the missing woman and the other driving the getaway vehicle. In 2007, Heather's mother, Sarah Teague, had her daughter declared legally dead so she could obtain the FBI's file on the case. Six years later, she filed a lawsuit against the agencies involved in the investigation, claiming a cover-up and malfeasance. Teague alleged investigators had gotten tunnel vision regarding Dill's guilt and had disregarded other possible leads as a result. She added that, in 1995, he'd been clean-shaven and balding, meaning he didn't resemble the sketch created from Walt Hill's description. A few months after it was filed, a judge dismissed the lawsuit, saying, among other things, that malfeasance couldn't be tried in a civil court of law as it's a criminal offense in Kentucky. Teague had filed several Freedom of Information Act requests and petitions over the course of the investigation into her daughter's abduction. Her efforts have resulted in evidence being tested for DNA and the handing over of Walt Hall's 911 call. She's also listened to a tape between Dill's attorney and the Kentucky State Police, in which the former was heard warning them of confronting the man without him first entering the home. In 2012, the Kentucky State Police put Heather's case on decks of playing cards that were passed out in prisons within the state. In January of 2024, an anonymous donor put up a $10,000 reward for information leading to a resolution in the case. Investigators say they continue to look into leads and are exploring new avenues in an attempt to locate Heather. Details Heather Teague was 23 years old when she went missing from Spotsville, Webster County, Kentucky, on August 26, 1995. She stood at 5'2", weighed between 90 to 100 pounds, and had brown hair and green eyes. It's noted she had fallen arches, a circular red birthmark on her right buttock, and scoliosis, which gives her a slight yet noticeable curve in her spine. At the time of her abduction, she was wearing a red plaid bathing suit, which was found near the abduction site. Case Contact Information Heather's case is currently classified as endangered missing with foul play suspected. Her DNA is on file. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Kentucky State Police at 270-826-3312. Tips can also be called into Sarah Teague at 270-824-8343. 
The Disappearance of Michelle Crawford Early Life Michelle Deanne Crawford was born on September 26, 1997 to Kathy and John Crawford. Growing up in Lawton, Oklahoma, she was said to be a generous, hard-working, and responsible person who was liked by everyone who knew her. She was also known to be a bit of an introvert, with only two close friends. At the time of her disappearance, Michelle was employed part-time at Gibson's department store and living with her parents at 2219 Northwest Lincoln Avenue. She was studying English at Cameron University, having secured a full scholarship for the upcoming semester. She'd hoped to one day become a teacher. Disappearance There is a slight discrepancy regarding the last time Michelle was last seen. Some reports state it was around 9 p.m. on the evening of June 8th of 1999, while others claim it was 11 p.m. She and her parents had all just gotten off work with Kathy getting ready for bed and John sitting at the computer. Michelle told them that she was heading to the movies with a friend, at which point she left the house in the family's gray, four-door, 1986 Honda Accord. When her parents awoke the next morning to find Michelle wasn't home, they were initially worried. They assumed she'd gotten up early to get in a session at the gym before heading to her shift at Gibson's department store. However, when her employer called Kathy to say she hadn't shown up, they knew something was wrong. Not wanting to waste any time, John and Kathy reported their daughter missing to the Lawton Police Department. Investigation Upon speaking to Michelle's two friends, it was learned that neither of them had planned to go to the movies with her on the evening of June 8th. The 21-year-old also hadn't mentioned what theater she was going to. A few days after Michelle was reported missing, on June 13, 1999, the family's Honda Accord was discovered at 1127 East Gore Boulevard between the Best Western Hotel and the Montego Bay Apartments. It had been parked crookedly and the doors were locked, apart from the one on the driver's side. While the missing woman's purse and other belongings were found within the vehicle, there were no signs of her at the scene. Since she went missing, neither the 21-year-old's bank account nor her social security number has been used. There's a purported theory her body was buried on private property in the Mountain View area of Oklahoma, but this is unsubstantiated and there are few leads in the case. Despite the lack of information, the investigation into Michelle's disappearance remains open. Given the circumstances, foul play is suspected. Details Michelle Deanne Crawford went missing from Lawton, Comanche County, Oklahoma, on the evening of June 8, 1999. She was 21 years old and was possibly wearing denim shorts and a black open strap sandals. She was also driving the aforementioned gray four-door 1986 Honda Accord, which has since been accounted for. At the time of her disappearance, Michelle stood between 5'1 and 5'3 and weighed between 119 and 120 pounds. She had a fair complexion with long strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. She had three surgical scars from a heart operation she had when she was an infant, one in the center of her chest and two on her abdomen. Case Contact Information Michelle's dentals and DNA are available for comparison. As aforementioned, foul play is suspected into her disappearance. Anyone with information regarding to the case is asked to contact the Lawton Police Department at either 580-581-3250 or 580-581-3270. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 580-355-4636. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, haunted, and unsolved mysteries. Before I go on any further, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge our elite members of Back to Ashes. 
Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Blaze, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. I can't thank you all enough for being the pillars on which this channel stands. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Yeah, I just can't say it enough, so thank you all. On to the other subscribers for the new timers that have popped in or maybe strangers that have popped in for the very first time. Thank you so much for your support. For without you, I wouldn't have a voice and this channel would not exist. Thank you and I appreciate your support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.